it's reflected in the fact that during the, the late 1980s and through the 1990s, approximately 80 jurisdictions either formally adopted new constitutions or made very significant constitutional changes in a liberal direction. And um, this also went with international agreements which had supranational constitutional effects. One that's actually been uh, a, 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 an item of, of minor discussion in the presidential election is NAFTA and the degree to which that could be renegotiated. Um, another example is the World Trade Organization, which was created in 1994. But it also involves other changes in macroeconomic policy, such as the um, balanced budget laws, the creation of independent central banks with low inflation targets. And these frameworks come together to, to, to have palpable, palpable effects on shaping uh, public policy. And um, in the World Trade Organization, for example, uh, signatories to the treaty committed themselves to quote unquote pro progressive liberalization of their economies. Um, and I went to, the, to Geneva uh, in 2001 to interview some uh, uh, met senior members of the WTO. And um, from those interviews, I think it was clearly recognized by the s some of the senior people there that what they were really doing was not simply liberalizing trade and investment. They were engaged in a fundamental redefinition in the forms of social and economic regulation, and therefore in the patterns of welfare, which had prevailed in many countries since World War II. Um, and um, you know, many organizations from civil society surround these WTO issues, and um, they're often seen as a threat to, the, to, to social welfare issues and uh, to democracy. And, uh, Many civil society organizations are, are, are engaged in um, efforts to oppose this type of um, governance in, in, in trade and in broader social life. So new constitutionalism I see as an effort to lock in commitments to liberal forms of development and governance that are ways in ways that are ultimately premised upon the primacy of uh, free enterprise and the extension of the world market. New constitutionalism is intended to make other strategies such as um, state socialism or state capitalism much more difficult to achieve because there is a kind of lattice, a very complex web of multilateral, bilateral, and regional treaties and arrangements. Um, and often these make nationalization um, of uh, assets um, and, and more extensive controls over private property difficult to bring about or even illegal. Um, and. Um, built into these agreements are not simply things which liberalize the world economy. TRIPS is a very good example, trade-related intellectual property rights, which is, is in fact a means to create a transnational regime of, of patent protection or monopolistic protection for the owners of uh, intellectual property rights. And it's very controversial for a, n a number of reasons. One, one reason is that it restricts freedom of exchange of ideas and communications among scientists and therefore may impair innovation. And how another objection which is frequently heard is how pa patent protections tend to skew research in financially profitable but not necessarily socially desirable directions. Um, an example would be how of 1,556 uh, approved drug patents issued uh, between 1975 and 2004 only 18 of them were against tropical diseases and three against tuberculosis. In other words, research is not skewed to dealing with the real global health problems um, uh, that people actually really face. It's, it's dealing with the medical problems of relatively affluent members of the society. Um, so it, it, it highlights a broader question which, was at, which, which to me was dramatized in a really excellent uh, um, conference that was held, hosted by the Off-Layer off, off Center, Mark Jürgensmeyer and Richard Falk, uh, uh, I think we're mainly involved in putting this together. And it, it raised the issue, the issues of how political and civil society actors um, saw these arrangements, whether these were, these, these arrangements, well, these arrangements are strictly legal in the sense that they are made by states, and ultimately states are the authors of, of, a, of a kind of legality. But are such arrangements legitimate? And I think that's a general issue in the clash of globalizations, the struggle over legality versus legitimacy in existing arrangements. And um, 
the way I conceive of new constitutionalism has partly involved a dialogue with liberal thinkers such as Hayek and Buchanan. And their notion of justice is a procedural notion of justice, one that's equally applied to all. They reject the notion of, of social redistribution or social justice. Um, and, um, but many of the forces in civil society hold to that notion of social justice, which they see as substantive and material and based upon uh, human needs. So how do we theorize this movement? Well, there are a number of ways to do it, but the principal way I've theorized it is in terms of what Karl Polanyi calls um, called the double movement. Um, and in particular, the way that Polanyi looked at the events of the 1930s and the way in which a commitment to, to certain types of, of, of liberalization of the world economy, um, and in particular those, those elements of liberalization that were um, inf heavily influenced by financial interests, um, brought with them, particularly after the Wall Street crash, um, um, enormous dislocations um, in the lives of people and in the lives of, 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 of the owners of, 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 of many businesses. Um, and um, he called this the first phase of the double movement, the, effect, the, the, the effort to extend liberalization, to extend the world market on liberal principles. Uh, and as it began to uh, create dislocations, it began to generate um, um, almost spontaneous reaction, counter-reaction amongst forces of, of society from across the range of interests in society. And it also gave rise to very reactionary movements, to fascism and Nazism. Yeah. Now, that's a, an excessively parsimonious theory of, of the emergence of fascism and Nazism, I know. But that's not the principal reason I'm making the argument. It's simply that um, the, experience, the collapse of, that, of, the, of the world economy, or the relative collapse of the world economy in that period, has to be conceived as partly involving the movement of social forces, particularly as, as social interests begin to, to seek protection and therefore seek alternative ways of addressing the question of, of governing the economy. Um, and indeed, that question was in the minds of the makers of the post-war international economic order at Bretton Woods. You know, the American leaders did not want to see a return to the Great Depression. And you know, as a result of the war and the sacrifices in the war, many other forces became influential in the formation of, of government policies. Organized labor, for example, broader social interests began to count. And a kind of compromise system was produced, uh, which John Ruggie has called embedded liberalism. Um, it's, it, it partly captures the issues, but we'll, let's, let's say that it, it captures this, that it recognizes a, that a coalition of corporate labor and civil society forces in both the US and its allied partners regulated the global economy, restricted the ambit of, of certain internationalizing economic forces, and tried to connect those to principles of social reconstruction and some principles of social redistribution. Um, by contrast, in the post-Cold War order, as we've seen the extension of uh, efforts to, to promote the world market along the lines I've just been describing, what I call disciplinary neoliberalism reverses this regulative principle and it promotes the world market as the principal form of governance. Um, and one could argue that it's paradoxical that the emergence of global civil society, which is also something that originates in the early 1990s as we currently understand it. Five minutes, okay, I'll, I might make it, good. Um, um, the emergence of global civil society in the sense that I'm talking about the, the, the formation of the commanding heights of strategic economic policy. Um, the emergence of global civil society, which we associate with um, um, not just civil society from above, with, we associate it principally in our minds with forces coming from below, has not democratized global governance in the sense that I, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking. In fact, in many respects, we've seen a more hierarchical set of power relations. And some examples of more unilateral and coercive forms of governance. Um, and many of these issues are reflected in the clash of globalizations because it involves issues of representation and the accountability of leaders. It's not simply a backlash against globalization. It concerns the ethics, the legitimacy, and the purposes of global leadership across a range of issues.